Thank you. I've listed today's topics. The first thing um, I'm going to talk about is some practical matters of the course. Um, I'm sure you heard or read about some of these things, but I'd like to review them. After that, um, I will provide some intellectual background uh, for the theory of frame semantics. Um, we'll look at some of Fillmore's early works, as well as um, some works from uh, the surrounding fields of artificial intelligence and cognitive psychology that also influenced Fillmore's uh, early thinking uh, on the subject of frame semantics. We'll review basic concepts of the theory. I'll talk a bit about frame semantics and lexical semantics, and then frame semantics and text semantics, and then we'll spend some time uh, thinking about and talking about uh, what we call scripts. So, for the practical matters, um, you now know that I'm Miriam Petruck, <laughs> and um, I hope that over the course of the next uh, few weeks, I will get to know who you are as well. Um, for this course, in order to benefit the most from the course, uh, you are expected to attend the lectures, um, participate in class, that would include both asking questions and responding to my questions. I know that uh, people may be somewhat reluctant uh, to speak in English. Um, however, I also know that at least some of you can speak in English, and I encourage you to do so. Keep in mind that um, whatever reluctance you may have, about speaking in English, uh, I have at least that much reluctance to speak in Portuguese. <laughs> um, we'll also have the opportunity to do some hands-on in-class exercises about the concepts that I'm presenting, and that will be an opportunity for uh, people to meet in smaller groups right here in this lecture hall. Um, during that time, Tiago and I will uh, walk around the room and see how you're doing and also give you feedback on what you're doing, how you're thinking about these concepts, and how you're applying them in the exercises. You have uh, already seen the, reading, the list of readings at the end of the uh, day's lecture, I'll remind you of what those reading assignments are. Um, I'll encourage you to bring your questions to the next day's uh, lecture. And depending on uh, what we're covering that day, I'll give you an assignment uh, to do at home. So are there any questions? Okay, so we're beginning with an, some intellectual background. Many of you, I'm sure, um, know about Fillmore's work, The Case for Case. Uh, in that work, he used a limited number of case relations such as agent, patient, and instrument. And later on, of course, we're going to see that using a limited number of cases is not feasible, right? And in particular, when frame semantics begins to be fleshed out, it becomes apparent that a limited number of case relations are not, is not going to cover all the possible roles that need to be filled. So just to give you an example, <clears throat> take the sentence, John broke the window. In that sentence, uh, John can be called the agent. 
And the window is the patient, right? John is the actor and the window is the affected entity. We might also look at the sentence, John broke the window with a hammer. And in that sentence, we add an instrument. So the noun phrase, a hammer, fills the role of instrument. In the next sentence, the hammer broke the window, we see the instrument filling the subject position of the sentence, right? And we have the window, the affected entity, still the patient. So we're beginning to get um, an idea of the very early concepts that become much more prominent and much more well described in frame semantics. Although at this point in time, in the case for case, the notion of frame has not yet been brought into linguistics. That happens a few years later. <clears throat> There's another, another uh, work by Fillmore, which was published in 1969, called Types of Lexical Information. And that's the one we're looking at now. That's the, example, that's the slide we're looking at now. In that uh, article, Fillmore says, the verbs rob and steal conceptually require three arguments. The culprit, that is, the person who's committing the robbery or doing the stealing. The loser, that is, the person or organization from which something is robbed or stolen, and the loot, that is, the, the property that's taken away. And he says, thus we can identify the culprit of Rob and the critic of criticize with, more, with the more abstract role of agent. In general, the roles that the arguments of predicates play are taken from an inventory of role types fixed by <coughs> grammatical theory. So again, here you see that the concept of a frame is kind of implicit, but not yet developed. And what's interesting here, I think, is that uh, the notion of a more abstract role such as agent is explicit, and when we get to frame semantics, as many of you know, we talk about role fillers or frame elements as frame defined in terms of the specific frame. So Fillmore starts out with a more abstract notion of agent, and then later on, we move to a more frame-specific notion of a role filler. Let's look at uh, a very important article, The Grammar of Hitting and Breaking. What's interesting to me uh, about these early articles is that you can see all the way back to case grammar, or so-called case grammar, because after all, Fillmore never called it case grammar. It came to be called case grammar by others uh, reading his work. But even as early as the 1968 article, you can see the uh, twinkling, if you will, of the stars of uh, frame semantics. And if you read the grammar of hitting and breaking carefully, you can also see that, from my perspective, it's easy to see anyway, that all of FrameNet is right there. And that was some 40 odd years ago. So the two important notions that were brought in uh, in uh, the article, The Grammar of Hitting and Breaking, are that of valence and roles versus entities. By valence, valence is what we also call combinatorial possibilities. 
And we'll talk more about that uh, as we go along. So let's look at the notion of valence uh, with the verb, the English verb, hit. In the first sentence, if I say, Paolo hit the window, we have uh, Paolo, the actor or the agent, in subject position. In frame net terms, we might call him the hitter. And the window, the patient in case for case terms, um, I think we have a special frame element label for the window, but at the moment I can't remember what that is, nevertheless. Uh, that fills the role of uh, object in the grammar of the sentence, and that's the affected entity. We also have the possibility of, of saying, Paolo hit the window